Hi, I'm Joe Hill, and I'm the author of NOS 4A2, or Nosferatu, depending on how you want to say the title, uh, and some other books, Heart Shaped Box and Horns. And I'm here in Iowa to read and sign and meet with readers. It should be fun. So Nosferatu is a big book. It's as big as my first two novels put together. And, and it, that, I wanted to do that. I wanted to do something on a larger scale than anything I had tried before. I wanted to do an everything but the kitchen sink novel. And so it's a book that crosses a lot of years. It takes place over 25 years. And it's also a book that crosses a lot of road. So we get New Hampshire, we get Massachusetts, we have Colorado, we even have a couple places that aren't exactly in this world. Um, and there's also a stop in Iowa at a fictional public library called the Here Public Library. And uh, that seemed like the proper setting for, uh, for us to meet a particular character. Uh, there is a character in the story named Maggie Lay, who is a punk rock librarian. And, uh, and uh, she has uh, an impossible gift. Um, she has a bag of Scrabble tiles, and she can reach into them and pull them out and throw letters on the floor, and they spell secrets. And I, uh, I felt that it was appropriate to, um, to place her in a public library in Iowa because there was some interesting history, some e interesting recent history about Iowa public libraries, which included some of them being flooded out a few years ago, and I wanted to... to touch on the tragic fate of some small town libraries and this seemed like the right place to do it. There are some questions that you hear from people on a pretty frequent basis. One I get a lot of times is if I write by outlines. I don't. I think outlines are the tools of the devil. So I, I avoid those like the plague. Um, and the question is a lot of times then if I don't work by outline how do I construct a story? And I construct stories by, I usually begin with a high concept because I think an interesting quirky concept is glue that sticks the reader to the page for a little while. But I don't think it will keep them going all the way through. I think what you really need is character. And so I look to build my stories around characters with interesting inner lives um, and interesting histories and odd compulsions. And I try to figure out who those people are. And once I know those characters, I feel I can plop them into almost any situation and then stand back and watch them try to punch their way out. So I, I feel that even though I'm a genre writer, I write thrillers, um, I feel that, I'm a, uh, that a lot of people in genre are, are people who work from plot and that I am a guy who works from character. Um, um, and so that's, that's something I get, a, that's, that's an, another question that I hear pretty frequently. I occasionally get asked if I've ever thought about writing anything besides horror or scary fiction. And I have sometimes thought about writing stories that are not um, supernatural fiction. But I think one thing that I would not be willing to abandon is the element of suspense. Uh, I think that suspense, the tension, the ticking bomb under the desk... Um, these are the things that keep the reader turning the page. Uh, it's, suspense is a, a simple term for that feeling that comes over you when you need to know what happens next. And I don't know, I don't know any other way to tell a story that I trust. Um, if you can't create a feeling of suspense, if you can't instill in the reader a desire to know what happens next desperately, then you've lost, um, or I would be lost. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, I could totally write something that was not supernatural. I could not write something that was probably not built around tension. I moonlight as a writer of comic books. My day job is writing the novels. But I also have a side job writing comics, and I've been writing an ongoing comic called Lock and Key for about five years now. Lock and Key is the story of a New England mansion filled with impossible and enchanted keys. And each key has a different power. There's one key called the gender key. And if you turn it and open a door and step through, if you're a boy, you'll turn into a girl. If you're a girl, you'll turn into a boy. There's another key called the ghost key. And if you use it to open a door and, and you walk through, your body will fall dead, but your spirit will travel on without free from your, your living flesh. And then you can always pass back through the door and, and be reanimated. 
One of the keys in this story is called the head key. And you can stick it into the back of your neck and it will open the top of your head and it will show your private hidden world of thought. All the things that, the, all the things you imagine, all your fears, all your excitements, your secret pleasures, um, your history is all there in this animated landscape. And I have an office uh, in, in my hometown of Exeter, New Hampshire, um, a third floor office. And that room is really like the inside of my head. And that's where I write all my stories. I have, I have uh, the covers to all my favorite books on the walls. Um, to the left of my desk, I have my 10 favorite books of all time. To the right of the desk, I have um, my, fav five, my five favorite movies, my five favorite albums, my five favorite TV shows. Um, everything in the room is kind of engineered to put me in that happy place where I'm playing make-believe and, and, you know, and, and it's all about pretend. Um, so that's where I go to work. That's where I've done my best work is in this particular office that I've had for a few years now. I do um, have my totems scattered around my office, you know, objects objects of power, items which mean something to me. And, and I don't mean that in some sort of in new agey supernatural way the the things that i care about often have very concrete messages that i call on when i'm writing so right behind my desk i have a framed cover for a book called the thousand autumns of jacob de Zoot by david mitchell and when i look at that cover i i can hear the sound of a certain kind of writing that i've always aspired to uh, um, there is david mitchell um, has captured something um, in his rhythms and in the feel of his sentences that is something I have always wanted my own prose. I have another poster over to the right of my desk which is the cover of True Grit by Charles Portis and I always think that Charles Portis has captured something in dialogue, something about the sound of his characters voices that I have always aspired to. And over to the left of the desk, I have a poster of Sherlock Holmes from an original illustration from The Strand. And there is something, there is a, a, a mood, an atmosphere of menace and possibility and, and intrigue um, that has always, I have loved since I was 12 and 13 and that I'm always reaching for in my own work. And so I keep these sort of, these items, these totems around me as reminders, very concrete reminders of what I'm doing and what I care about. I'm, I know that some people really struggle to get sentences on the page. For some people, it's really, and, it's, it's, and I have had difficult times too. For some people, it's very hard to chip through that stony soil and, and get to the ore, you know, get to what's good. But I have to admit that, that I have always had a big engine of make-believe. I have always had... Uh, this tendency to drift off into my own thoughts, my own inner world, and play, and to the point where, you know, I'm the sort of guy who will um, uh, miss the door and walk into the window next to it because I'm off in my head writing that story. And I have never really found the environment where I couldn't put sentences together and, and escape, you know, jump through the escape hatch of my own imagination and begin writing scenes. That doesn't mean that, that you know, if I'm writing on a train, that doesn't necessarily mean it will be good writing. Um, but at the moment, I enjoy doing it. So I haven't really found an environment, you know, um, where I just couldn't write. I have three boys. They're rowdy and loud. Um, they, uh, um, they're pretty adventurous. You know, there's a lot of slamming doors in my house and yelling kids and stuff. And I'm reminded of Louis L'Amour, who wrote 120 novels, some of them with the grandchildren right under his desk biting his feet. So uh, I don't think it pays a writer to be too particular about the conditions under which they work. If you need the incense in a certain kind of light and there's only one kind of coffee bean, roasted coffee bean, that, that can provide the coffee that will inspire you, you're probably being a little too fussy. And, um, you know, I, I try to avoid being that kind of writer. When I'm working on a story, the first draft is for me. And... I throw a lot of stuff at the page. Uh, I will write dozens of pages uh, discovering a character, putting them in situations just to see how they'll react. In the new novel, NOS 4A2, um, 
I wrote a whole novella about the bad guy, Charles Manx III. Charlie Manx, when we meet him, is a century old, and he drives a very bad car, a Rolls Royce that runs on human souls instead of gasoline. And Charlie has used the power of this car to keep him young, keep himself young and fit. And he, he, you know, he drains the spirit out of the passengers who ride with him, usually children. And then he dumps them at this otherworldly amusement park called Christmas Land. And when he's finished, when he dumps them, when he's finished with them, there's not much left to them except teeth and hate. And I wrote a novella about who Charlie was before he first used that power. I, I wrote 80 pages about Charlie's first trip to Christmas Land with his children. And I think there's a lot of good writing there. I think there's, it's a good story. Um, but when I got to the second and third draft, I cut it out of the book. And I did that because the second, every draft after the first draft is for the reader, not for the writer. The reader takes that first draft to figure out their characters, to figure out the structure of the story, to figure out what the story is about. But as you move forward from that starting point, every draft has to be about what the reader needs, what is going to keep the reader turning pages, what is going to keep them entertained, what do they need to know about these characters. Um, the hero of Nosferatu is a young woman named Vic McQueen. And when we meet Vic, she's just an eight-year-old kid. And by midway through the story, she's a 30-year-old woman with a child of her own. And we get a chunk of narrative about Vic as a kid, dipping in and out of perilous adventures. And then we jump forward to her as a mother with only about 25 pages in between. We only get a brief glimpse of her as uh, this young woman who is, is in a, um, a loving um, but imperfect relationship and just being a young mother. Um, I wrote more than that about Vic, but the reader didn't need it. Um, a, a taste, just one little taste was all the reader needed to know what happened between um, before and later. I think that when people read my books, they feel that they're very carefully structured, but the structure came after the fact. It didn't come beforehand. It, it, in, in first draft, um, it's a big mess, and scenes are out of order, and there are scenes that don't matter, um, and there's material that somewhat works that sputters along and then you know scenes that begin well and then end badly scenes that begin badly and end well and and the next two you know three to seven drafts is about shaping that material into something where it, not just every chapter feels like it matters but every paragraph feels like it's having it's adding up to the whole in some meaningful way um, and, and, you know, I do th sometimes think that outline is, outlining is some bizarre attempt to spare yourself of the agonies of revision. Um, this, it's this fantasy that you can have it perfect uh, in first draft. And I always think if you're writing honestly and really exploring the characters, um, it's very unlikely it's going to be perfect in first draft. Because for starters, your, when your, your characters, if they really come to life on you, will refuse to cooperate with your outline. They will make choices that surprise you and that run in a completely different direction. Um, problems you thought they would take hundreds of pages to solve, uh, they will solve in one bold stroke, uh, um, you know, cleaving, cleaving that knot you know, um, with a stroke of the blade. Um, other problems that you thought would be very simple for them to resolve uh, will become agonizing for your characters because of who they are and their own particular deficiencies and flaws and foibles. Um, and and so, I, so I do think that it's important for everything to matter and for everything, to, all the parts to feel tightly, that they, they fit together tightly. Um, but I, I believe you get to that uh, um, through a slow, somewhat arduous process of honing and sharpening and revising and cutting away and just being really ruthless and brutal with your, yourself about, you know, what you need and, and what you don't. Um, trying to, you know, you have to determine um, 
the difference between what you love and what the reader will love. And having and you have to have the, the strength to say, well, the stuff that I love can go. I wrote it, and I loved it, and it was fun. Um, but now I need to think about what the reader needs, and they don't need this. Hemingway's uh, you know, uh, famous line is, kill your darlings. Um, I, I don't know that you always do need to kill your darlings. I do think a lot of times when you get into a long project, uh, you have this one scene you're dying to write. And you'll look ahead and you'll say, I'm only 100 pages from it. I'm only 80 pages from it. I'm finally going to write this one wonderful scene that's going to make the whole book, you know, it's going to be the big fireworks going off in the center of the book. A lot of times in second and third draft, it turns out that one scene you desperately wanted to write is the easiest scene to cut. You know, it's the, it's the one scene nobody needs. Um, and, uh, but, but still, it's nice to have some goals to shoot for, some darlings. I think it's good to have darlings before you start bashing them all on the head, on the head with the hammer. The word just is a really bad one. That's one that's crept in from speech. Words, there are words people unconsciously use in speech, like just, all right, always, uh, actually. Actually is a terrible word. Actually is actually a really bad word to use in writing. Um, um, and I, I, I try very hard to, to keep away from... Um, um, filler words like actually, um, which which can only harm the cause. Uh, you really, I'm a guy who believes some of the most beautiful sentences in the world are just two or three sentence, two or three words long. Um, you know, flies hummed is a great sentence. I love that. When I sit down to write, a lot of times I'm just trying to get that first two or three word sentence. I love to begin a day with a five word sentence, just something tight and compact that feels factual and clean and is immediately evocative. And once that's, that can be the hardest part of the day. And once I have that, that one sentence, that one simple, clean sentence, a lot of times I'm off and running. You have to find ways, you do have to find ways to recharge. My way is generally to skin helpless animals while they're still alive. I've, I've discovered that can be very restorative. Honestly, my way to recharge is to read. I, I, I care much more about my daily reading than I do about my daily writing. Um, don't tell my editors that. Uh, but um, I, I am a guy who thinks that um, I, I love stories and I love beautiful writing. You know, I love to read David Mitchell or Patrick O'Brien, the sound of their sentences, uh, the satisfying weight of their characters. And, uh, you know, if I had to give up one, I would give up writing in a heartbeat over, you know, instead of reading. Um, so I do that. Um, I have three boys. They drag me out of my head, like it or not, one way or, you know, one way or another every day. Um, and uh, I do have a Triumph Bonneville motorcycle. The, uh, the hero of Nosferatu, Vic McQueen, um, has this reality-bending vehicle, a Triumph Bonneville motorcycle, which he can use to find lost things and to cross astonishing distances in just a, you know, bl a blink. And uh, my Triumph Bonneville isn't quite that magical, but, you know, a 20-minute ride is very cheap therapy. It's, you know, um, 125 bucks for, to see a therapist and, you know, 350 to, for a gallon of gas. Um, so uh, I do like to get out and ride now and then. Every t book out, I have tried to set myself a new goal. I have tried to do something I didn't do before. Uh, in the case of... NOS 4A2, in the case of Nosferatu, I wanted to write something on a vaster scale than anything I had done before. I wanted to write something that covered a lot of road and a lot of time. I also wanted to write a, a, a female protagonist. I had written two novels and several short stories that had male protagonists, and I wanted to explore a female lead. And one of my favorite writers growing up uh, was is Neil Gaiman, uh, who wrote the Sandman series and the Graveyard Book and a lot of wonderful work. And I think that Neil, more than any other writer uh, when I was coming up, was a guy who tackled genre stories and introduced female characters that were really unique and funny and powerful and distinctive. And, uh, and he really gave, I think he set the bar very high and I wanted to try to clear that bar. Mm -hmm.